Good afternoon and welcome to Ducks in a Row Estate Planning. My name is Beverly and I'm the Communications Manager for People's Memorial Association. People's Memorial Association would like to acknowledge the traditional, ancestral, unceded territory of the Coast Salish, Duwamish, and Suquamish nations on which we work and live. Before we get started uh, today, I just have a couple of standard housekeeping items. We've got almost 150 people we're expecting today, so we're going to go ahead and keep everyone on mute just to keep the noise down. It's very exciting to have such a big group. Uh, we know there's just going to be so much information here that you'll want to remember, so please don't worry about frantically scrambling to get all your notes down. We're recording today's session, and I will be sharing that recording with all of today's uh, registrants so you can refer back to it later. And I bet if we ask really nicely, our presenter might even share her slides. Um, as those questions occur to you, please feel free to drop them into the chat box or use the Q&A feature. And if you're a little more on the shy side, please feel free to directly message your question to me and I promise I'll keep your identity secret. Um, we're gonna go ahead and tackle all those questions right at the end, so please don't be shy. If this is your first time joining us, well, welcome. As I said, I am uh, with People's Memorial Association and we're the oldest and largest memorial society here in the US. We were founded back in 1939, right here in Seattle. And we provide funeral education and advocacy services for all Washingtonians. If you're joining us from a little further afield or perhaps um, have loved ones in other parts of the country, fear not. There's about 65 similar organizations around the country doing some similar work to us. So it's distinctly possible an organization a little closer to home is uh, available and maybe worth looking into. To date, over 217,000 folks have become members of PMA. And of those folks, about 71,000 of them are still living. So we stay very busy in the office, as you might imagine. And in terms of how we support those members, well, one of the biggest things we do is education. We offer webinars just like this, and we host a real bevy of free resources on our website and our Facebook and our Instagram. And I'm still on the quest to become a Twitter expert, so cross your fingers for me. In addition to education, we also are pretty proud of the advocacy work we do here to support our state level legislature in increasing funeral choice, increasing price transparency in a notoriously opaque industry, the funeral industry, and also protecting cultural rights. Oh, just got a pop up, sorry about that. Uh -huh. So here in Washington, we are blessed to have an incredible diversity of people with all different faiths and ethnicities and practices, and all of them deserve equal access to affordable cremation, burial, aquamation, and natural organic reduction, as well as the necessary spiritual practices that go along with those. So pretty important to us, gotta say. And uh, if you are just joining us for this session for the first time, you might not know this is part of an entire series. This is the final in our Ducks in a Row series, but we do have some upcoming sessions that you might be interested in checking out. I'm going to be in person next week uh, doing two different presentations on funeral options. So if you missed our online funeral options 2.0 last week, I'll be presenting it myself at Wedgwood Presbyterian here in Seattle. And then a couple days later, I'll be doing a session specifically about greener funeral options if you're interested in learning more about the environmental impact of death care. And that session will be hosted by the Greenwood Senior Center. Enough about me. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our wonderful host, Pam Hunter from the King County Library System. She's joining us from the Glacier region. Hi there, Pam. Hi, Beverly. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming tonight. I just have a few things I wanted to share with you as things are changing quickly around the library and COVID. So um, our website, which Beverly has been gracious enough to put into the uh, chat in our former sessions is kcls.org. Thank you, Beverly. And also on that um, homepage, you'll be able to find a link under the calendar for all of our online programs. So as you may know, most of our buildings are now open six days a week. And to find out what your local library is open, uh, what those hours are for you, you can click on the hours and locations link on our homepage. Well, masks are optional and it's completely up to you what you wanna do with that. Uh, we have probably about half of the people who come into the library now wearing masks and some you know, um, are still feeling comfortable with not wearing masks. 
So in April, we will begin to have some in-building programming, um, but we will be continuing online programming as well because it's been as so popular. So uh, look for that on our webpage as well. So um, today we were told that on Wednesday, May 4th, the public will be able to book our meeting rooms again, which is a big thing for a lot of people who need a meeting space. And on Sunday, June 19th, the small rooms that we call study rooms will also be available for the public to book. Now, not all study rooms will be open in all libraries because we are still using some of those for uh, programming, like I'm in one right now. So I think that's all I need to tell you about tonight. And if you have any questions, please feel free to, to put them in the chat. Thank you, Beverly. Mm, well, thank you, Pam. And uh, KCLS is hosting us for the series and we're really happy to have so many other patrons joining us. It's great to get to meet some new folks, but I saw some familiar names on the registration list. So I know we've got some PMA friends here as well. Well, the real reason we're all here is to get the skinny on estate planning. And luckily I was able to snag Tiffany Gordon from KHBV Law. She has been working with us for just years and I know she is going to give us some really juicy information today. Welcome, Tiffany. It's great to see you again. Maybe see you again. <laughs> Here we are. There she is. <laughs> hey there, Tiffany. Hi there. Thank you so much. Sorry for the delay. Um, and yes, I have been doing this for years. So I moved here in 2009. Um, and became a member of PMA shortly thereafter. I was on the board for a few years. And since we've instituted the Get Your Ducks in a Row program, um, I've been involved with that. So um, it's been quite a while. Mm. Uh, thank you everyone for being here this afternoon, especially in light of the fact that it's now 64 degrees outside. Don't tell people, they'll leave the session, Tiffany. I know. Or you want. Stick around, it's gonna stay, it's gonna stay <laughs> nice throughout the evening. So, and it's getting, it's getting, or uh, staying later, later, so. Mm -hmm. I'm going to hand it over, only if you promise not to chase any more attendees off. <laughs> I promise. Okay. All right, thank you so much. So I'm going to share my screen so that everyone can see my slides as well. Um, and I will say that in addition to being a, um, a PMA member, I also am an avid um library borrower. So I have, both of these organizations uh, are near and dear to my heart. So I'm really happy to be here. Um, in terms of what we're gonna be talking to, about tonight, um, this is again, get your ducks in a row. We will be talking about some estate planning basics. And as Beverly mentioned, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A function, and we can get to as many of those as possible as we get a little bit closer to the end of our time together. And if you don't get your question answered or you come up with a question after the fact, feel free to send me an email. My contact information is included on these slides, which I will um, provide to Beverly so that way she can share them with all the attendees. And you'll be able to reach me, just put PMA ducks in a row or something like that in the subject line. So I know um, kind of where you're coming from and can, can respond to that. So in this world, nothing is certain but death and taxes. So our, our friend Benjamin Franklin there, um, I love that quote and I have a little bit of dark humor being um, an estate planning attorney and a trust and estate administrator and litigator, but this evening, we're going to talk primarily about the planning side, so the death side, less about the taxes side, but in terms of just a couple of things that I want to flag for the group, there are a few taxes that come into play when at, at death. Uh, there's a one-time transfer tax that can be due um, for decedents' estates depending on whether or not they reach these threshold levels. And that is, the, is, is, an, is a transfer tax. And that's what the estate tax that you hear about um, is typically, that's typically what people are referring to. Now, the federal exemption amount is a little over 12 million per person. And that is doubled for married couples. So I joke that I really hope to have an estate tax problem someday. I don't currently. 
Um, but Washington has its own estate, estate, estate tax, and our exemption amount here in the state is two million one hundred ninety-three thousand. So, as you think about kind of your, you know, real estate that you might own, or retirement accounts, bank accounts, investment accounts, and this also includes life insurance. So, oftentimes we don't think about life insurance policies on our own lives as assets because we don't spend them during our lifetimes. We, you know, designate a beneficiary and then one day after after death, that policy pays out. So it doesn't feel like an asset to us. However, it is taken into consideration for purposes of calculating um, and assessing whether or not estate taxes do at a decedent's death. So that's something to kind of keep in mind as you're thinking about whether or not um, the estate transfer tax would apply uh, in your situation. But I just wanted to flag kind of a couple things about the estate tax um, so that you kind of have those on your radar. And certainly if you have questions about that um, or that's something that applies to you, by all means, feel free to reach out. I'm, I'm happy to answer questions um, about the estate tax or really you know, anything related to trust in estates. This is a chart, and you can find this online as well, um, that basically shows, kind of breaks down the Washington state estate tax. Um, and this is, again, if, if uh, the estate is over that threshold amount of 2,193,000, there's a range of tax um, percentages ranging from, as you can see over here, from 10 to 20%, depending on how much the taxable estate is. And then, the federal uh, tax runs from about 18% to 40%. And again, it's depending on what the um, taxable estate actually is and, and what amount the tax is calculated on. So anything at the federal level above that roughly 12 million exemption amount. There are a couple of other estate related taxes that I just want to mention because the estate taxes is, is a big one, but also when, when someone dies, the other kind of taxes that come into play are one, depending on, you know, who's appointed as the executor um, and the decedent's income in their final year of life, their final income tax return is also something that comes into play. And, and the other the other potential tax that comes into play is the income tax with respect to the estate. So like we as individuals file a form 1040, which many of us are probably doing right around now <laughs> for filing for the April 15th deadline, with estates, they can pay income tax too in the event that they actually generate income. And so, for example, if someone had a rental property, that's a really typical way that their estate would generate income after death. And so for that, you know, several months or year period that their estate or their probate is open, so to speak, there could be estate tax, estate income tax that's due. And that's a separate return called a Form 1041, very similar to the Form 1040. So just to kind of summarize the, the tax piece there, the estate transfer tax, which is the biggie estate tax, can come into play depending on the level of the decedent's assets. Of course, the decedent's final income tax return is very frequently um, something that should be on our radar when looking at a loved one's estate if we're serving as executor or personal representative. And then um, finally, potential income tax within the estate that would be reportable on that form 1041. So those are kind of the pieces, um, the tax pieces as a, in a thumbnail sketch, so to speak. So with that, I wanna look at kind of some of the additional um, details that we're gonna talk about and really kind of the meat of this presentation, which is the estate planning basics. So I always tell clients <laughs> that the durable power of attorney, in my opinion, is the very most important part of a foundational estate plan. And we're going to talk about wills and we're going to talk about revocable trusts here in a few minutes. And it's very, very important where we direct our assets to go one day when we're, when we're deceased. But in my opinion, the durable power of attorney is the most important piece because this document takes effect during lifetime. And it, and it takes effect immediately for healthcare purposes and either immediately or upon incapacity for financial purposes. And what this really means 
is this is a way to have someone on deck, so to speak. And this can be, um, you know, a spouse, it can be a family friend, a sibling, you know, it can be a financial or excuse me, a professional fiduciary. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. But basically what this document does is it puts someone in place, it appoints someone to serve as our agent for both healthcare and for finances. And that can be a different person or entity for healthcare than it is for finances. If you think about just the people in your life and your family members, um, probably there are certain people who come to mind that are very you know, good at managing their finances and, and maybe do things in a similar manner and have a similar philosophy about personal finances that you do. And that's someone who might be a good selection for agent for finances. Whereas the healthcare side is more related to end of life choices and communicating with, with healthcare professionals and doctors in the event that the principal, me in this example, um, is unable to do those things on, on, my, on my own. So for example, if you know something were to happen to me where I was you know ill for a season, or this was more of a long-term illness, you know, we think about family members and friends, we all, you know, all of our lives are touched by Alzheimer's or dementia in one way or another. And we could talk all day long about the things that could happen to our human bodies and still not think of all of them. But in any event, basically what the, the way that you set this up is you appoint someone that is on deck to serve as your healthcare agent and also as agent for finances in the event that you become unable to serve on your own. Basically, you can't write the checks for your mortgage or manage your checkbook or make sure your taxes are filed, pay your monthly bills, take your required minimum distributions from your IRA if you are of the threshold age. Um, all those things that you typically do on your own or that I typically do in my own life, this person or this entity is appointed as agent under the durable power of attorney to basically step in in the event that something were to happen to me, either a long-term illness or even something short-term where I was unable to manage those things on my own. And they can step in and make sure that all of my financial life remains intact um, and that everything that normally occurs on a monthly, quarterly, annual basis is, is still um, being taken care of. Similarly, on the healthcare side, we oftentimes think about the healthcare agent just in those really dire circumstances, maybe we've experienced with a parent or a grandparent with life support, artificial food and hydration, and certainly the agent for healthcare um, is very important in those circumstances. But even if, you know, there's you're not in a near death situation, but you, for whatever reason, are unable to manage your health care and you're, you know, receiving some sort of treatment or, you know, want to receive a treatment or would, you know, elect to receive such treatment if you were able to communicate that with your health care providers. But for whatever reason, you're out of commission, you're incapacitated. The agent for health care is able to step in communicate with your doctors, ensure that you are receiving, you know, the, the health care and the treatment that you would elect to receive if you were able to communicate that on your own. So that's a really important job. And um, like with all of these types of positions, the agent for healthcare and agent for finances, as well as, you know, executor and trustee, we'll talk about those in a minute. It's really important who you select. And so thinking about, you know, who you have in your own life, that would make sense in those circumstances is, is really important. So somebody who has similar healthcare values and end of life values or is willing to listen and will ensure that your intentions are carried out if they are called upon to serve. And similarly on the financial side, ensuring that you select someone that is financially responsible first and foremost, but also has a similar philosophy to you or is at least willing to implement the way that you do things in the event that you're unable to do so. So in terms of what's required for a power of attorney is it needs to be signed and dated and it either needs to be notarized or witnessed um, by two or more witnesses uh, in that um, principle. So in the example I gave using myself, I'm creating the power of attorney for myself. I'm appointing someone to serve as my agent. I would be the principal and the person that I appoint is the agent. So this needs to be done in the presence of that principal um, and either at their request or direction. Now, secondarily, the durable power of attorney 
power for the agent ends when that principal breathes their last breath. So that document is only effective during life, whereas the will is something that you've probably heard of before, might even have one. Um, and this is something that doesn't take effect until after the person dies. So this um, isn't something that takes effect during life. It's completely revocable during life. You can change it. And it basically provides a roadmap for distributions of your probate assets at death. It appoints someone, an executor or a personal representative to do sort of the business side of death is really what that looks like. I think that that's a good way to kind of capture it. That person, the executor or the personal representative, administrator, those, those are used somewhat interchangeably. Um, that person is sort of in charge, as it were. You've appointed them under the terms of your will. They go out, they make sure that they understand where all of your assets are. Um, they gather all those assets. They may need to you know, sell your house. All the things that are essentially kind of wrapping up your financial life after, after death and then make distributions of those assets according to the wishes that you've expressed in your will, so or according to the roadmap that you've set up. And interestingly, a will, unlike um, some of the other documents that we're going to talk about, after death, a will is filed with the court. And a lot of times folks will say, do I need to file my will with the court before, before death, while I'm still alive, in order to ensure that it's valid or something else? No, the will doesn't typically get filed with the court until after death. And I say typically because there are some counties and some kind of more old school practitioners, and this is something that historically was more popular, where folks will file their will with a will repository um, with their county. And that you can certainly do, and King County does have one. Um, most of the time, if you have an estate planning attorney, they'll, they'll store your original will in their vault. We do, some, do that for most of our clients, and it's not something that you incur an expense for. There is an expense associated with the repository. But again, it's not required that you store your will in one of those places in order for it to be valid. Um, and when a will is filed with the court and required to be filed with the court is after death. And so basically, um, the, you know, the decedent dies and then the executor has 40 days to file that will with the court and then can open the probate as necessary. Um, and that's really where the court just formally appoints the executor or the personal representative according to the terms of your will. And they're able to move forward gathering assets paying final expenses, filing that last income tax return for the decedent if necessary, making sure the taxes are paid, um, you know, filing an estate tax return, the, that's the transfer tax, that's that 2 million and 12 million exemption threshold um, filing that we talked about at the very beginning. And that's what the executor does, is he sort of, he or she handles the business of, of wrapping up the decedent's estate and assets and wrapping up their affairs. And so in terms of the, re the requirements here, um, you know, it's a validly executed writing. It needs to be signed by the testator, by the person making the will. So for my personal will, I'm the testator. For your will, you're the testator. Um, it needs to be signed by two or more competent witnesses, meaning that they're of sound mind and that they're over age 18. Um, and those need to be signed in the presence of the testator. And this is just a little comic. <laughs> I would like a will to be prepared. Nine to be exact, says the cat. <laughs> so one of the other documents that is probably somewhat familiar to you is the revocable living trust. And that is something that is somewhat of a will substitute. We're gonna talk about some differences in having a will versus a revocable living trust here in just a few minutes. But one of the big differences is this is a document that's really active during your lifetime, and it also governs distribution of assets at your death. So it does provide that similar roadmap that a will does, but it's something that you, um, during your lifetime, folks will typically, if they're using a revocable trust, there's a reason for it. And so they will change title of their house to you know, the name, rather than it, my home being in my name as Tiffany Gorton as an individual, it's in the Tiffany Gorton Revocable Living Trust. And I'm serving as trustee because you serve as trustee of your own trust during your lifetime. Let me make sure that I clarify 
something. There are a number of different types of trusts out there. Some of them are vehicles for, you know, real estate specifically or life insurance specifically or estate tax savings. This is a very specific type of trust that is, like I said, it's very much just a will substitute. And so when you're thinking about your own estate plan, you weigh some factors and say, do I really want to use a will or do I really want to use a revocable living trust? And here are some reasons for using this type of trust. Typically in Washington, because our probate process is so not onerous, unlike places like California, for example, where it's an expensive process, it's a long drawn out process. Here it is, is much um, simpler in that there's a $240 filing fee. You file the will with the court or you file your petition with the court and say there was no will, but I have to open this probate to administer the estate. And then the court gives the executor or the administrator what's called letters of administration or letters testamentary. And that allows that person to go around and gather the assets take care of all the taxes, take care of any final expenses, et cetera, and then ultimately distribute the assets. So that's in a nutshell what the probate process is. And because that's not particularly onerous here in Washington, wills are used probably nine times out of 10. Folks, regardless of you know, whether or not the, their estate is you know, multi-million dollar estate or they only have a Buick and a base fiddle, because of the process being somewhat streamlined here in Washington um, and less expensive than it is in a lot of other places, wills are typically used for most Washingtonians instead of a revocable trust. However, there are certain circumstances where it makes sense for a revocable trust. And part of what that trust does, if it's funded properly during its lifetime, meaning you take the time to change title on your house to your revocable trust, change title on your accounts, um, certain accounts to your revocable trust, then you avoid the probate process or your heirs or your beneficiaries avoid the probate process after death because the assets are already housed in that trust and can then be distributed according to the terms of the trust by the successor trustee. And so there's no probate court filing requirement. However, again, in Washington, it's not a, a huge onerous process. And so that probate avoidance um, principle is not as important to most Washingtonians as it is to folks in some other states where probate is a real headache. Um, some of the time that I will recommend to clients that they may wanna consider a revocable trust is if they have out-of-state real estate that's a really big one. Um, so if you have a, a second piece of property or a piece of property period in Oregon or Idaho or certainly in California, really any place other than Washington, then I will oftentimes say, you know, what makes might be most efficient to use a revocable trust because you can title that property in the other state in the name of the trust. And then what happens is you don't have to have a probate in Washington and a probate in Arizona or Oregon or whichever other state there's real estate owned. Um, and so once you start having to have multiple probates in multiple different states because of real estate ownership, that's a really good time to consider using a revocable trust. One other um, distinction between the revocable trust and the will is like I said before, after death, a will is filed with the court. And so then it essentially becomes public which is okay because most wills don't have, you know, social security numbers or account numbers or, or um, you know, there are not security concerns for it for the most part. But some folks say, you know what, I don't really like anyone being able to see who my beneficiaries are. And a revocable trust, on the other hand, is not filed with the court. The only folks that see it are the trustee and the beneficiaries. So no one else is entitled to it. And so that can be attractive if you are just interested in privacy just generally or if maybe there are you know there's a there's a black sheep in the family who likes to cause trouble there would be an extra hoop for them to jump through because they wouldn't even have access to the document and i say that a little bit um as a, in jest but in a in somewhat of a real way because i do spend probably about 50 percent of my practice doing trust and estate litigation and so i see when you know, potential bad actors come out of the woodwork or, you know, folks just want to misbehave. Or sometimes there are, you know, real concerns as to um, issues that, you know, need to be rectified. 
And so I see a lot of disputes relating these types of things. And so that's why I say, you know, some folks, depending on the circumstances, might just be better served having a more private um, document, so to speak. And so we talked a little bit about what probate is. Um, again, it's a court supervised process of basically settling the decedent's estate. Um, in the court, what happens is once you file the will and you file your, your petition and your order and your oath with the court um, and the court signs off on it, the court doesn't typically oversee your every move. So you just have a forum, so to speak, that gives you power to sell the house that belongs to another. Whereas, you know, if something were to happen and, you know, you're mother died and you were not appointed as her executor, you wouldn't have the authority to sign a deed to sell her house. Whereas in the probate process, you get that authority from the court. And then the court basically says, go administer the estate, come back and tell me when you're done, and then we'll close this estate. For the most part, the court doesn't get involved after that initial um, appointment of the executor, unless there are um, dispute issues, or if you um, need instruction on something because, you know, hard to value asset or you can't find an heir or something like that. But for the most part, the court's pretty uninvolved unless they need to be. And again, um, part of that process is, is gathering the assets, you notify the decedent's creditors, file any tax returns, and then ultimately distribute assets according to the terms of the decedent's will. Now, this is important, um, turning to kind of non-probate assets. We talked about having assets placed in a revocable trust. And so certainly property that's held in trust is going to be a non-probate asset, meaning it doesn't have to go through the process of probate in order to be distributed to the beneficiary after death. So assets in trust follow the roadmap of the trust, and the successor trustee has the authority to make distributions under the terms of the trust after the decedent dies without any court intervention or supervision or any type of probate process. Life insurance policies are another typical non-probate asset in that they have a beneficiary designation associated with them that's unique to that particular policy. And if you fill that out and you make it known who you, you appoint your beneficiary, so to speak, then at death, that's essentially like a contract. It just passes the, the proceeds from that insurance policy will pass to your designated beneficiaries without them having to go through the process of probate. If you have your estate listed as the beneficiary on your policy, or you have no, no beneficiary listed on that policy, then it becomes a probate asset and the probate is required in order to make the distribution there. Um, property that's subject to a community property agreement is also going to pass without probate um, without the re requirement of probate. And what that is, is typically, this is a little bit of an older school planning tool, but frequently um, in, in you know, historical planning days, married couples would have community property agreements that basically provided, upon my death, all of my assets are going to vest in my surviving spouse. And then this other spouse has the same, essentially the same statement in, in the agreement provides that at the death of the first spouse, all the assets are owned by the survivor. And so there's not a probate requirement at that point. However, that doesn't direct where those assets go after both spouses are gone. And so having a will becomes important, particularly after the, after the first spouse's death. Um, and so that's why I say that this isn't a, a, util, a typically extensively utilized tool, but it is something that, you know, avoids the probate process um, or any requirement thereof, at least at the first step. Um, assets that are titled as joint tenancy with rights of survivorship, those are typically um, like checking account, savings account, and some investment accounts. Um, if you have, you know, Oftentimes a spouse or a partner will be on that account and it's joint tenants with rights of survivorship, meaning that when the owner dies, the joint owner becomes the owner of whatever remains in that account. And sometimes that's um, a good way to kind of utilize um, that, that transfer without probate requirement as part of a planning tool. But it's really important that first and foremost, you ensure that the beneficiary designations and the titling on your assets matches what your intent is. 
And so typically, you know, you go through the exercise of setting up a will and listing all your beneficiaries and how you want your assets to flow either to, you know, various trusts for kids or grandkids or charitable organizations. But if you have different designations on your insurance policies or on bank accounts or your ownership on bank accounts has this joint tenants with right of survivorship language, then you can inadvertently, if they don't match up, so to speak, we can inadvertently have assets that flow to a joint owner or to a beneficiary when you actually intend to kind of follow the roadmap of the will. And this, um, this joint tenancy issue comes up a lot in a parent-child situations where maybe someone puts their oldest child on their checking account so that they can write checks to assist them if needed and inadvertently makes that adult that you know that oldest child in this example a joint owner and then when mom or dad dies suddenly that child owns all the assets in that account and that may not be what the parent intended. They just really wanted them on there for simplification and to be able to write checks, but suddenly they're the owner. And some financial institutions use that right of survivorship as their default. So if you add someone, again, simply for purposes of being able to write checks on the account or to you know, have online access or otherwise, oftentimes they will automatically be include that right of survivorship characterization, even if the um, the, the bank account owner or holder doesn't intend that. So it's just important to know how your accounts are titled and ensure that the, um, the way that they're titled and the beneficiary or designation or pay on death or transfer on death um, detail is in line with what your intentions are. And so again, all of those assets will pass via their own contract. They don't require probate. Now, of course, if you have investment accounts, brokerage accounts, bank accounts that have no um, joint tenant with right of survivorship designation or don't have a beneficiary designated, then of course they'll flow through the probate process and they'll go according to the terms of your will. But if you have policies or accounts that have beneficiaries designated otherwise, then they're going to pass via those um, beneficiary designations and not under the terms of the will and no probates required for that. So here's an example, and this is just a typical um, married couple that basically provides that, you know, they have property passing for their surviving spouse. Um, and then the, the residue, this is a little bit of kind of general tax planning, which allows basically the, the first spouse to die's assets to go into a special trust called a credit shelter trust for the surviving spouse. Um, and then the survivor's property at the second death is going to pass according to their own direction to their descendants, et cetera. And <clears throat> the reason that I've included this is oftentimes for married couples, they'll use that credit shelter trust type language and the ability for assets um, to flow into a credit shelter trust at the first death for a couple of reasons, particularly um, this is a this is a tax savings mechanism. So remember at the beginning, we talked a little bit about the estate tax and the fact that Washington has that $2 million exemption amount. And for married couples, that can be effectively doubled to four and same at the Fed, 12 for each person and can be effectively doubled for to 24. And the way we do that in Washington is we preserve that first spouse's credit shelter amount by putting their half of the assets into a credit shelter trust for the benefit of the surviving spouse during their lifetime. And then at the second spouse's death, that credit shelter trust flows down to descendants or you know, kids, grandkids, et cetera. Um, and same with the surviving spouse, the second to die spouse, their assets flow down according to the terms of their will, either to charitable organizations or other beneficiaries that they wish to include. And folks will use this one um, to preserve that first spouse's estate tax exemption amount. And basically that doubles that 2 million to 4 million. And then also with folks who are married, maybe a second marriage and have children from a prior marriage that aren't the children of their current spouse, 
um, having the assets flow into that type of trust for the surviving spouse allows the surviving spouse to utilize those assets during their lifetime, but then the assets will flow according to the terms of the, the parent of the child from the prior marriage, for example, to their descendants, et cetera. So essentially, this piece right here sort of locks in what the first spouse directs with respect to their assets. And then the surviving spouse can, of course, direct where their assets go. But this ensures that you leave assets available for a surviving spouse, but that they um, that the overall plan doesn't get upended after the first spouse dies. So that's just a for folks that are that are married, um, that's something to to consider in terms of one, the ability to double that credit, um, that estate tax credit exemption amount, and two, to ensure that proper planning is done if you do have kids from prior marriage or special circumstances and want to make sure that um, you're directing where your assets go at the end of the day, but also protecting that um, that surviving spouse. So with that. Um, I'm going to look at some of the questions here in the chat. And Beverly, do you want to read those out for me or do you want me to go there? I could certainly go ahead and uh, kind of organize them a little for you. Okay, great. Okay. And there's some good ones in here because you sure awesome. cover a lot. Um, <laughs> great. Just a reminder, please don't be shy with your questions. I imagine between Tiffany and I, we've probably heard just about everything. So no judgment here. And, um, you know, if you're still kind of metabolizing all this information, we're going to make sure that with the recording of today's session and the slides, you'll have this contact information for Tiffany and for me. So you'll be able to ask us questions later as well. So how about we start with um, a simple one. So with that Washington state tax, um, are those limits set per person or is it for a couple or a household? Okay, so with the Washington estate tax, is that the question or is that for, so that is an individual amount. So each individual has uh, the exemption amount of 2,193,000. And if you are married, you utilize that credit shelter trust like we talked about in that diagram. That's how you essentially use both spouses exemption amounts, but each person only has that 2 million amount. Okay. Yeah, I kind of have to agree with you there. I hope I have this problem someday. I know. <laughs> okay. Well, um, so what about when someone is on disability or receives any kind of welfare income? Are there any parts of this process that might look a little different or special considerations? Yes. Um, so when folks have any type of government or they're receiving like a government or charitable type benefit, um, mostly this comes up with Medicaid qualification or disability. And the individual who is doing the planning, if they're the person who's receiving those benefits, there isn't necessarily anything special that they have to do in terms of their planning uh, because those benefits end with death, unless there's a, there's certain like pensions and things like that that have a survivor's benefit. But typically in terms of just planning around those benefits from an individual perspective, there's not anything necessary that they need to do in order to like direct where the benefit goes because it usually stops at death. But for example, um, there are some Medicaid benefits that of course you qualify for during your lifetime when you're using that government benefit. And in order to qualify, you have to be below a certain threshold of assets. So folks will do what's called like a Medicaid spend down if they anticipate they're going to have long-term care requirements or otherwise. And that type of Medicaid planning is a specific type of planning. There are attorneys whose entire practice surrounds that Medicaid type planning. And actually, that might be a good topic for another Ducks um, presentation now that I'm Ooh, thinking that about down. it That's here. such a great idea. Um, but that is something to definitely consult an attorney on that does that because there are rules in terms of the timing of spending down those assets and when you can qualify for Medicaid. And the other thing to think about just in the general estate planning realm when that comes up is when a beneficiary, so not you yourself, but when a beneficiary, either a child or a friend or whomever you want to remember in your will or in your estate plan, if that individual is receiving some type of a government benefit due to disability or otherwise, 
make sure that you flag that issue for your estate planner, because there are certain ways that you as the kind of donor can plan around that for that beneficiary to avoid disrupting their benefits, but still remember them under the terms of your will. So for example, that's important. <laughs> That you can include that has very key components that won't disrupt disability or Medicaid benefit type benefits. Mm, good to know about that in advance. That would be an awful surprise when you're trying to do a nice thing. Yes, exactly. You mm. you know, inadvertently they lose their lose their benefits, unfortunately. So mm. no, make sure that that's flagged in the event that you have anyone in your life that um, that qualifies for those things. Okay, that makes sense. All right, got another easy one for you. With respect to powers of attorney, is it okay that you have a different one for your health than for your finances? Do they have to be the same people or is there anything weird there? They do not have to be the same people. And frankly, if you think about who you have in your life and what people's strong suits are, it's oftentimes a different person that makes sense to assist with potential healthcare needs versus potential financial needs. So no, they do not have to be the same person. And oftentimes it's two different people. Can you designate multiple people to be your financial uh, POA? Like maybe have like a backup or maybe shared responsibility? You can. And I I always recommend having a backup and a backup to your backup if possible. Um, So list those folks kind of in a row. Mm -hmm. And you can also name joint um, folks for healthcare or for finances. I am typically of the mind to avoid having too many cooks in the kitchen, but (laughs) it makes sense given the circumstances and the folks that you want to designate, then, you know, by all means, it's a personal document and it's a personal choice. So if that makes sense for you for one reason or another, you can certainly dominate, you can certainly appoint co-agents for healthcare or for finances. I just recommend that you include language that allows them to act independently. Mm-hmm. So for example, not every, not two people having to sign every single check and that makes it easier <laughs> to administer, administer things rather than you think you're setting them up for success mm-hmm. and you're actually adding an extra layer. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so the next one, a couple more POA related questions. So if someone doesn't really, oh, where to go? Um, if they don't feel like they've got someone in their life that they feel would make a good healthcare advocate or would be a good power of attorney for their finances, you did mention fiduciaries. How can someone look into hiring someone to act in their best interest for positions like that? So there are, um, there are a lot of resources, particularly in the Puget Sound area, that aren't necessarily just like big bank trust department that will serve as, a, as an agent for finances, as a trustee, um, and as executor. So those are kind of the financial piece. Um, there, are a, there are less of those organizations that will serve in the healthcare realm, as you can imagine, but they do exist. Um, and any on the healthcare side, I would look at places like Guardianship Services of Seattle um, and uh, Private Client Fiduciary. Some organizations that are all, that also take appointment as guardian for folks because they're typically able and set up to serve in that in that healthcare realm differently than than someone would serve for finances. They can serve for finances as well, but particularly if you're looking for someone on the healthcare side. Yeah, good point. Someone's curious, you know, I think I'm gonna get myself a professional fiduciary, but they said the internet searches are getting so sketchy. What are they looking for when they're trying to find one? You know, maybe what's a sign of a good fit or something like that's just a big old red flag? I would say that most of the, I would take with a grain of salt what you find on the internet, aside from their website and information. And what I mean there is any um, reviews. Because as you can imagine, folks don't typically review organizations when they're happy with them, unfortunately. And so what I would say is look around, see who serves as agent for finances, who serves as agent for healthcare, successor trustee, executor, all those roles can be filled by a professional. And I would look for a smaller organization, but not necessarily a solo shop. And that way you can reach out to someone and say, hey, I'm interested in appointing you under my documents. And then just sort of get a feel, have a conversation. It's not unusual um, for folks to to contact one of those, one or more of those organizations in advance of appointing them, just to kind of get a feel for what their team looks like and and how they operate. Um, So you can make an informed decision. And 
frankly, you appoint them in a document and hopefully they're never called upon to serve, but um, you want to make sure that you've kind of done some investigation in advance. But I would say take the reviews of the grain of salt and, you know, a chartered trust company, if necessary, if you are going to have someone serve as trustee. Um, but there are a lot of them. So even if you just do a Google search of like, King County professional fiduciaries or something like that. A lot will come up and you'll have a, a wealth of um, stuff to sift through, but reaching out to individuals to see about having, you know, a 10, 15 minute phone call um, is really a good place to start. That makes sense. It sounds like they can do quite a lot. Um, folks are curious, is this an expensive service to retain one of these fiduciaries? It depends. So it, they don't, they do charge for their services. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes Rarely, it's this is more popular on the East Coast, but it does happen here um, in in Washington. Um, folks will ask their their estate planning attorney to serve as executor or as trustee, and that is sometimes that makes sense depending on the circumstances. But it is that is an expensive option because you're paying an attorney rate essentially for non legal services, whereas these professional fiduciaries are set up and specifically act in that capacity. And so they have a team of folks that do, you know, some administrative, more administrative tasks. Some folks work directly with the CPA for taxes and things like that. So it's a little bit more involved and they bring a little bit more expertise to the table, but they'll have a tiered system and charge typically hourly. Um, for trust administration, if you use a larger outfit, like a bank trust company or something like that, which makes sense in certain circumstances. Sometimes they'll charge based on the assets under management. And that's part of the questions that um, I recommend asking in that initial kind of consult of what's this gonna cost me or my heirs in the event that they're called upon to serve. So it sounds like there's a lot of good options out there. So it definitely would bear out to do a little comparison shopping among options. Yep, absolutely. And, that, and that is not a, that's not a weird question to ask. What am I going to be paying? <laughs> I think that's a pretty <laughs> healthy question to ask anytime you're making a big purchase like absolutely. that. Well, um, you know, you were just uh, mentioning, you know, who you designate as the executor. And one of the questions we got is, you know, what happens if you die and whoever you've designated is unable to get their hands on your original will? Um, that, that is a great question. So that happens from time to time, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And once they've looked around for it, um, called the drafting attorney, if there was one, um, or, you know, looked through the filing cabinet or wherever, you know, the deceased person keeps their important papers and they just cannot find the original, they can file a copy. So if they have a signed copy, they can file a copy and they tell the court in, in a pleading mm -hmm we're filing a lost will. It's called a lost will because you've lost the original essentially. And you believe that it wasn't that the decedent destroyed it and meant to revoke it, that they simply misplaced it. You've been unable to find it and the court will admit that. Yeah, but maybe a good reminder that there should be some open conversation among your support system about where your important documents live. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't hide them too good. <laughs> right. Um, let's see, what about... Da -da 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 -da? What if the, uh, a person that's appointed as the executor uh, never reports back to the court? Hmm. So we read that again, Beverly, just to make yeah. sure I'm getting all the specific words in there. Yeah. So the question says verbatim, what if you never report back to the court after being designated the executor of a person's will? So typically, like I said, you, you follow all the court you get yourself appointed and then the court doesn't bother you because they don't typically need to. So you're often able to administer the estate. So if you just, if you sell the house and transfer all the assets and file the tax return, et cetera, et cetera, then typically what you do is you tell the court you're done and you file a declaration of completion and then the court closes the file. Okay. If you don't do that, then typically some time goes by and it can be quite a lot of time. Like it can be a couple of years. The court, as you can imagine, is busy and they're not just keeping tabs on all the probates at all times. And so, you know, there's a, there's a reminder that pops up when they do their review every so often. And if you're on that list of, you know, estates that are not being administered or there's nothing happening, they'll administrate, they'll let you know um, that you're on their list. And they'll ask you about it, <laughs> but in, you know, it doesn't mean you're bad, a bad actor. Um, 
but ultimately they'll administratively close it if they don't hear anything from you. That makes sense. And um, yeah, just sit, like close due to failure to prosecute or something like that. And I've, I've seen that happen because I've had folks that have come to me after the fact where they find another asset that belonged to mom that they need to reopen the probate after they yeah. opened it on their own and then didn't do anything or didn't are, do everything. There, or they are found they able a, to do that? Yeah. Yeah, oh, you okay. could petition the court to get it reopened. All right. Good to know. Mm, stuff does tend to turn up after a while, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Um, okay, so we have a question about, um, we've got a few philanthropists in our midst. midst Great. And, Remember um, the King County Library System and PMA. I mean, if you've got your checkbook out, I would be <laughs> remiss in discouraging you. Um, so folks are thinking, you know what, I've got some charities that I want to be donating to, and I've got my estate broken down into percentages about who, what goes where. Is that enough? Is that like how you do it? Do you do it percentage or quantity or any ideas? It depends. There's no, there's really no right or wrong way to do it. Um, we have some, I have some clients that it's based on a percentage of the residue. Some clients have a specific asset, like the proceeds from the sale of my house go to ABC charity. Um, some folks, depending on the makeup of their assets, will, um, one really good way to utilize retirement accounts and get the most bang for your buck is naming charities as the beneficiary on retirement accounts because they don't pay the income tax on the income that's baked in um, to that those retirement assets when they take the distribution. So a dollar is actually a dollar in those accounts going to charity, whereas you know there's some income tax that's built in when a human beneficiary withdraws. Um, and it really it really just depends on what the makeup of that individual's assets look like and what their intention are is rather. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's a combination of assets in percentages under their will or various accounts going to this one or that one. There's more than there's more than one way to do it. And it really just depends on what the assets are and what the person's intent is. You and know, it always sure tickles that. me when you say human beneficiary. So I have a question about that. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, you know, when you've got your charities all sorted by percentage and, you know, you've got your people that are designated, um, is there a way that you can, you know, reward your POA for doing all this hard work? Do you just like put them in there as a percentage also? Does Certainly. You know? So there's no involuntary servitude. So under really? the law, regardless of whether you provide for the personal representative or not, they can charge for their time. So, and that comes off the top of the estate because it is a job. Um, it is not, it's not just an honor, it is a job. <laughs> um, and so they have the ability to charge a reasonable rate for mm -hmm. the work that they're doing. So cleaning out the shed is a little less mm -hmm. expensive than, you know, dealing with the CPA or, or you know, filing the taxes, et cetera. Um, but they can charge for their time. But certainly I have folks that say, you know what, I want to remember them with the with the specific gift of, you know, X number of dollars or percentage. And you can do that as well. And you can say you can have them do that, you know, in lieu of, you know, tracking and charging their time if you'd like. Yeah, that might, might be easier. I know I'm doing that in my own uh, estate. I figure if my uh, POA has to run that much interference with my family, at least I could do set aside a little money for her to get some therapy after work. <laughs> Good point. And no. one thing, one thing there is because you're charging for your time as an executor, um, it's technically taxable income. So you would report it. Whereas a gift under a will. So if you just say, you know, $5,000 to my personal representative, mm -hmm. um, it's a gift really not necessarily income. I'm going to bookmark that bit. Um, so I thought that was interesting. You mentioned that, you, you know, you really can't force someone to take these roles on. So what happens if the person that you've designated, like your executor, just doesn't do their job? Like they don't want to be involved. So if they decide if it, well, one thing to think about when you're setting up your plan is ask the person if they would be willing to serve. Well, better. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but if, you know, circumstances change, life change, things go on. Um, and so if they're, if your executor is not able to serve when they're called upon, or maybe they predecease you, for example, yeah. um, they don't have to serve. It's good to name a backup. And if your backup can't serve either, um, then there is a laundry list of folks that are able to serve really any adult um, who's not a felon can petition the court. And frequently it's another beneficiary. You know, sometimes folks say, you know what, I'm leaving everything to this one charity. 
-hmm. and the executor either isn't available or otherwise the charity can serve or they can get a professional fiduciary and say, hey, we'd like you to serve to you know, do this administration for us. So there are a lot of different ways that you can, um, someone gets appointed to make sure that those assets are administered. Oh, that's important. Wow. Okay. We still have a couple more. I know we're at 602 already, but we still have some really good questions. Do you mind tackling a few more? Sure. I can take a couple more. All right. Hopefully I'm going to stay in Pam's good graces and not run us too late, but just too many good questions here. Okay. So if let's take a couple of real estate questions, maybe. All right. Um, so we've got one where someone wants to know, you know, let's say our primary residence is under one person's name and the spouse has signed the quit claim deed. If we have a will, would that be enough to direct the property to the surviving spouse? So let me say this in what I think you're asking. So my name is Tiffany. My husband is Nick. Mm -hmm. The house is in my name mm -hmm. and I sign a quit claim deed providing the asset to Nick transferring title during life, then that property would be in Nick's name and no longer in my name. Mm -hmm. um, so that would transfer it. But if Nick died before me, mm -hmm. I would need to get it back. And yes. so I would have to figure out a way to do that. So I would say, if you have some specific things that you want to occur after death, I recommend at least doing a will. Mm -hmm. um, you could do a transfer on death deed to transfer mm -hmm. that property at the first spouse's death. I haven't actually used that mechanism for gifting purposes like that, but that is something that you could consider if it's just that simple of person A to person B. Mm -hmm. um, you could do something like that, but the titling issue, say for example, you split up mm -hmm. before death, even if the property is in one person's name, if the other person contributes any way financially or sweat equity, um, there could be a question of, do they already have some sort of community-like interest in the property? So, mm -hmm. and if you want to control where it goes after the second spouse's death, um, I would consider doing, um, looking at that more, more directly. Hmm. Yeah, it sounds like there's a lot of questions there to follow up with. Um, speaking of the, it depends. <laughs> yeah, I, I know, right. I'm sure people get so frustrated, but you know, it is really always a unique question. Um, so someone wants to know, you know, after the death of a second spouse, what is the estate tax rate for the children that remain? Um, is it based on, and that's those same standards of anything over 24 and everything, anything over 12, or is there something different? That's exactly right. Because the estate tax, unless the first spouse gives away more than $2 million in assets to people that are not the surviving spouse. Mm -hmm. The estate tax doesn't really come into play for married couples until that second death, because there's an unlimited marital deduction from one spouse to the other. Awesome. So assets that go either directly from, in my example, from me to Nick, or from me to a trust for Nick, mm -hmm. those assets are not gonna be subject to estate tax at during Nick's lifetime. Then when Nick dies, if we had children or whatever heirs we had, beneficiaries, mm -hmm. they would be tasked with looking at, okay, we used you know Tiffany's 2 million and Nick's 2 million because we utilize that credit shelter trust. Mm -hmm. And in this scenario, I have a lot more assets than I do. Um, <laughs> and- then at that point, the, the tax is going to be calculated on what is over the exemption amount at the second death. So yes, the answer is yes. And that chart is, is how it's calculated. That makes sense. So someone wants to know, speaking of the credit shelter trust, does the surviving spouse have to file the deceased one's will in court if there is a credit shelter trust? Anytime a person has a will and dies, you're required under statute to file that will with the court. Even if you don't have to do a probate, you do file the will with the court. And it's not simply because they have a credit shelter trust. Um, it's simply because the will exists. That's the reason that you have to file it. But if you need to transfer title and take that deceased spouse's name off various assets, like a house, for example, mm -hmm. then you likely will need to open a probate at that time and then take title off, fund the credit shelter trust, meaning put half the house in or you know whatever the makeup of the assets are, you put in the appropriate amount title in the name of the credit shelter trust, and then you utilize the assets inside the credit shelter trust for the survivor's benefit. So it, it depends on what the asset makeup is, but if there's a will in existence, it has to be filed with the court, even if you don't have to open a probate. 
Okay. Um, you had mentioned earlier, um, someone pointed out that wills are public documents. Um, how can people get a copy of one for someone? Um, like if one of their parents had a will that they haven't been able to get a copy of, how would they do that? So what I, where I would start is I would look at the Washington State Court website and okay. see if that will has been filed with the court. And basically you go to the county. It's usually in the county that they lived in. Mm -hmm. It can be any county in the state, but I'd start with the county they lived in. Mm -hmm. See if there's a probate that's opened um, or a will that's been filed. There, you, know, you type in the person's name. You mm -hmm. can see that way. If the will hasn't yet been filed with the court, um, you can check in in the various counties in their will repository to see if there's a will on file for the deceased person. Um, if it's circumstances where someone is withholding the will and either not filing it or not producing it, mm -hmm. um, then, I mean, you can take action against them because they're required by statute to file with the court mm -hmm. within a certain number of days. Good to know. Mm. So. Okay. All right. So I've got... Let's go ahead and just close with this one right here, because this is an interesting one. Um, you know, it's a lot of responsibility, like you mentioned, to be the executor. And it sounds like there's a lot to keep track of. How long are you expected to keep all of the records and all of the paperwork and everything if you are acting as someone's executor? Oh, that's a really good question. So it's not like our own lives where we keep tax returns for, what, seven years or however long. Mm -hmm. um, one, you could scan those documents and keep them forever in the cloud, but you don't have to. Once you have your filed your declaration of completion and the probate is closed, you don't really need to keep them for any reason. Other than if you say, you know what, if some random thing were to come up and, and come along, but the closing of that probate by telling the court I'm finished and you know the beneficiaries or heirs have 30 days to file an objection to that closing. Um, if they don't, they're kind of out of luck. So it's unlikely that anything would come up after the fact that you would need those records for. Good to know. Um, okay, awesome. Well, we're coming up on 610 now. And um, if you need a little more time to kind of mull over your questions, like I said, the follow-up email is gonna to include today's recording, Tiffany's slides, as well as the contact information for her and for us at PMA, so that you can follow up and maybe hash through some stuff that might be of a little more personal nature, or you know, you just kind of need to sort your thoughts out. I always think of my questions after these presentations later when I'm washing my hair or something. It's <laughs> not a great time to ask, but please don't be shy. Um, it's been such a treat um, having so many folks join us today and bringing in such great questions. Um, Pam, did you have anything you'd like to say before we close out today? I um, just want to thank everyone for coming. We really appreciate it. And thank you, Tiffany, for all the great information. Oh, yeah. Thanks a lot. It was my pleasure. Wonderful. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and close our session out for today. I'll have my presenters and uh, my host here hold on for just a second while everyone files out. So yeah, everyone, I expect to hear from me in the next couple of days, and I'll make sure I include the follow-up information as well for those in-person sessions I'm doing next week about your funeral options, just in case you'd like to enjoy some of this uh, sunny weather and come see me in person. Uh, it would be great to see some faces there. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.